Good evening. My name is Kevin Vogt. I am Director of Sacred Liturgy, Music, and Art here at St. Michael the Archangel Catholic Church in Leewood, Kansas. On behalf of Father Brian Schieber and our whole parish church, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to this Doxa Conversation at the Crossroads of Worship, Culture, and Art. Our presenter this evening is Haz Nassal, an internationally acclaimed glass artist from our own community of Overland Park. Hasna was born in India, where she was raised in a Muslim family and educated in a Catholic school. She later studied journalism and art in England and architecture at Boston's Wentworth Institute of Technology and at Harvard University. She taught design at the University of Kansas and worked as an architect in Topeka, before embarking on her current career in glass art. In 2018, she was awarded the prestigious Doge International Award at the Art Biennale in Venice, Italy, and in 2019 was a featured artist at the International Contemporary Art Cannes Biennale at the 72nd Cannes Film Festival in France. Well-schooled in Christian ecclesiastical architecture, Haz Nassal has a unique perspective on the transitional interstitial space of the church called the narthex. As one who has encountered the Christian faith from the outside, she has herself encountered the divine at the threshold of the sacred space. It is from such an encounter in the in-between spaces of life and experience that a miraculous work of art was born, a fused glass sculpture entitled nativity triptych. While we will only see projected images of this remarkable work tonight, it is possible to see and touch the work in person just 30 miles from here at the Savior of the World Pastoral Center in Kansas City, Kansas, where it enjoys temporary exhibition. Please join me now in welcoming Hasna Mariam Sal. Thank you everyone for being here this evening. This means a lot to me. Today I'm going to talk about my Manium Opus, the uh, biggest, grandest, and most meaningful work that I have ever created in my career as an architect and artist. Um, and before I do that, I want to thank very uh, a select number of people who have been instrumental in um, bringing me to where I am today. I begin with Father Brian, uh, who uh, gave me this opportunity to present this evening, uh, Dr. Kevin Vogt, Director of Music and Art. Uh, he's, he approached me and said, would you give this talk? It's my greatest honor to talk to you this evening. Sarah Kuhn and the Worship Commission, and, uh, and, and my friend, Dr. Siji Joseph, who, uh, without whom none of this would have happened. He connected me with Dr. Vogt, who's become a really good friend. And, and, uh, and finally, to everyone here this evening, I know that there are a lot of places that you can be on a Friday evening. The weather's beautiful outside, but you chose to come here. And I am honored, I am grateful for your time, and I hope I will make it worth your time. Uh, without much ado, I will, uh, I will take you on this journey um, as quickly as possible, but giving you a good idea of where I come from and how this work came to be. Um, okay. The beginning. Uh, we, my family comes from the Vipan Islands of Kerala, India. We are islanders for centuries. And um, this is the Vipan Islands where I'm from. Uh, on the island, we always believe that uh, the most important, the powerful, uh, the omnipresent um, element on the, on the island is the sea, the water. We have water in the lakes, the rivers, the canals, 
and of course the sea. So water is a very important part of our culture, of our, uh, of our sustenance. It is the giver of life. It is the blessings from the heavens. So um, this is uh, our Vipan Island. And that's my home with my mother, uh, you know, orchids. It's all, it rains a lot on the island, so that's why it's nice and it's so lush and green and, and, and uh, colorful on the island. Um, but I grew up in Mumbai, a bustling city. Not so much water there, but um, this is St. Anthony's School where uh, I, I uh, went to do my elementary school and that was my first introduction to Catholicism. St. Anthony's Girls High School. That's the school I went to to do my elementary school. So this is a large school with uh, three floors and uh, you know, wandering, I still, I still remember like it was yesterday. Uh, I probably was six or seven years old and uh, I would wander the hallways of my, my school of concrete and brick and, and mortar. And, and one day, one special day, just any ordinary day, I came across this. This was my first introduction to glass. And for a little girl growing up uh, in a Catholic school uh, where you know, we had to wear gray pinafore and, and white shirt and a tie, and if discipline was the word. Like we had to talk softly, we had to walk quietly unless it was uh, during uh, playtime where we had to play respectfully, not make too much noise. I mean, it is in Catholic school in India, I don't know how it is over here, but in Catholic school in India, they're very disciplined and you have to always behave like a lady. Um, except when you, when I went into this church, you know, went into this place, which I, a six-year-old, called myself, called it the, uh, the magic place. And I saw a fascinating group of people. So for my six-year-old mind, that was a man flying in the air. And there were, there were all these people around him. And how cool is it? Like he's, he's like in a playground and he's jumping up and down. And then all these people are in colorful clothes. There's somebody in blue, there's yellow, there's green, there's red. And look at the sky, it's so beautiful. Unlike the smog filled uh, Mumbai, here the sky is colorful. So it is, there is nothing more enriching to a little mind like color and light is so beautiful and happy. Um, it was my enchanting place. I was, I was in St. Anthony's for four years and uh, I would visit this place every day. It was my place with my friends that I would be absolutely happy and joyful and, and just be myself and talk to them. And there would be days uh, when it's dark and you know it's monsoons and then they would all not be so colorful. And my mind, I'm thinking, they're not having a happy, happy day. They're, they're, they're sad, you know, and I would ask them why they're sad. And then there were days when the sun is out and they're all colorful and I'm like, oh yay, you're in a good mood, so am I. So, you know, we, we had so much fun, so much fun until, until dad got a job in the Middle East. And this is around the time that I was 10 and we had to leave. Now, paradoxically, my whole family was very happy that dad got a job and in the Middle East and, you know, you know, very big promotion and he's going to be the director of, you know, this company and, and, and everybody in my house was very happy except me. I was sad because I had to say goodbye to my friends. So um, I said goodbye and I left for this. I left for the desert. Stark, blaring, glaring sun, very uncolorful. This is Saudi Arabia. And this is where I did my middle school and high school. This is the school I went to, the International Indian School. Stark, highly academic, very rigorous in, in, in academia. Um, not, there, there is no color, there are no playmates. You know, you, you, you follow a very strict, stringent lifestyle. 
So uh, I just turned completely to my studies and forgot all about color and light and, and, and friends uh, in glass and uh, with lots of color. Um, another thing that always strikes me is the terrain in Saudi Arabia, very rocky and the, the yellow of the sun is so harsh. All this comes into play later on in my life. Uh, the experiences that you gather in your childhood become so important as an adult. And uh, that's why it's important for me to mention this. From uh, Saudi Arabia, the next place was uh, England. Uh, and and I, I, I did my um, journalism from the London School of Journalism in, in England, um, Wales and Cornwall. And also I did fine art uh, at the same time from the Falmouth College of Art. And uh, just that, again, not so much nature, it's more gentle rolling hills, but the beaches and the, and, and the, and the, uh, the, the mountains and the waves um, brought out that artist in me again. I think that, that going away from the Middle East and coming into all this beauty inspired the artist in me. And my medium, uh, my chosen medium became watercolors. So here are some examples of what I created in watercolors uh, at my college. So after England, um, my husband and I, we moved to uh, Boston, Massachusetts, where I pursued with my, with my uh, portfolio of drawings, I pursued my uh, professional degree in architecture and urban design from Wentworth Institute of Technology in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, over here, again, in my third year, we had to choose our thesis subject. I chose glass. Everyone chose metal, laminated timber, concrete, uh, etc. I steel, I chose glass. Uh, I don't know why, but I think somewhere in the deep recesses of my mind that the, the glass work had something to do with it is what I think now looking back. But um, at that time, I picked up glass thinking I'm going to become a glass architect. I'm going to make glass buildings, uh, glass curtain walls. That's going to be my journey. Never thinking that I'll end up uh, making being a glass sculptor. So after Wentworth, I taught for a little while. I worked as an architect and I taught for a little while at the University of Kansas as an adjunct professor teaching design. There also I taught glass more, mostly in tectonic terms uh, as, a, as a material used in construction and cladding. After that, uh, I went to Harvard uh, to pursue my graduate studies in landscape architecture. And something interesting happened over here uh, while doing my uh, presentation, uh, which I did completely in glass. Um, the head of the department said to me, Hasna, you've created a benchmark for Harvard. So that gave me the impetus to really pursue this material and, and take it to its fullest extent and see how I can create uh, out of the ordinary with glass as Frank Lloyd Wright did with concrete back in 1945. So for me, again, it was purely from an architectural standpoint, uh, thinking about how to work with this material and, and, and you know, push the boundaries, make it structural, make it compressive, make it tensile, things like that. So um, that, is, that, I, that, that is what I learned at, Har at Harvard. And, um, and then I started working. Uh, became an architect and um, uh, I was working in Topeka, Kansas, uh, taught at uh, KU, um, taught my students um, architecture. And meanwhile, uh, after about a few years, my son uh, was um, um, playing the, p the piano and guitar and, uh, and I was doing my work and I was so inspired listening to him play the piano because I, I feel like music is the highest form of art and, and just listening to him play I said you know uh, you have one life let's just do what you want you know what you want so I decided to uh, pick up the cello 
and so i started learning uh, to play the cello and and uh, mr fair paul fair kind of looks like elvis presley you know with his pants and everything and his uh, sideburns he comes in and then uh, just a delightful delightful man and then he said to me he said okay hasna let's begin now what what do you want to play and i said um mr fair i i want to play silent night and i think uh, <laughs> i took both of us by surprise so uh, he was like oh okay and uh, and and i said yeah that that's what i want to do i want to play silent night so uh, i started learning silent night playing my cello listening to my son aram play his piano and at that time i got one of the biggest commissions of my life too a uh, client said to me can you make a 25 feet by 26 foot mural on the ceiling uh, of my residence and i said sure so i started doing that uh that's when things started beginning to change for me um something very uh otherworldly started happening i i had this blank uh, piece of wall on the ceiling that i had to create with and uh, i had absolutely no idea what i was going to do but i took my material which is acrylic and i started and as i started creating this work um my hands would move like music it would keep the swirly lines that kept happening was uh was just I, i it came from somewhere that i had not even this is the this is it was a spontaneous work i had not even created uh a, a, a precedent for it it just it just happened on the spot right there um much like 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 rodan or a jackson pollock kind of just on the spot i started creating this and as i'm creating it as i'm creating it in the colors in the blue i start seeing jesus uh and 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 in the reds and the yellows and the and the oranges i start seeing father father joseph i start seeing mother mary and and i it just this this work took me a few months to create i went through few months and two kidney stones to finish what i did but at the same time i went to my client and said i am so sorry but i need to stop creating i need to stop doing this work because i have to create this installation of mary jesus and joseph because i'm not able to do anything else i was not able to sleep i was not able to think of anything else i would go into my studio and i'm like why would i do this who am i going to do this for nobody has commissioned this where is this going to go who who is going to buy this what is its path in life i had i had so many questions no answers but at the same time as an artist i couldn't do anything else this is it this is all i could do so i went to the client knowing full well that i'm going to lose my commission i said i need to create this and i'm so sorry but i can't do anything else and they looked at me and they said is this really what you want to do i said yes i'm so sorry but yes and they said then do it and uh thus it happened and i created it over a period of 5 or 6 months um this work was created from somewhere i don't know where and it's just it's a work that has not had a single mistake there's not been a single error i had a finite amount of material to make it with if i made a mistake i didn't even know where i'm going to get more material to replace it with but it just moved like music it happened so organically and here it is
This work is inspired by Silent Night. Thank you, Dr. Vogt, for um, playing this music because this, this song was in my mind the whole time when I was creating this work. Um, it is seven feet, nine inches tall and eight feet, six inches wide, comprised of three panels. Each panel is 34 inches in width because I knew I had to get it through the door and each door is 36 inches wide. So, um, and to understand this work, the narrative is being told through three media. There are three, narr there are three narratives that are happening in tandem, in conjunction to tell you the story and in the in, later on, I will also show you other artists who have also done the same thing in the past. But the three narratives that I'm using are color, symbology, and allegory. Allegory, by the way, is uh, um, a technique used in the beginning of time with Christian, uh, Christian art. So, um, Christ. Um, when I created this work, I never went to any, unlike all what we architects do, we look at precedent studies and sustainability studies and feasibility studies and stuff. When I created this work, it just came from some place, somewhere. Uh, I, I, I really believe this when I say that it is, a, it is a higher commission that made me create this because I didn't look at any pictures. I didn't know what I was creating. And uh, I chose to create Jesus in blue. Why blue? Because remember, I come from the islands and in the islands we say that blue is the color of the sea, it's the color of the sky, and it is uh, the giver of life. So uh, for me, Christ gave his life so we could all have a life. So for me, it is, it is that, uh, and, then, and, the, and the way it moves, you know, like the water. So that's why I created Jesus in blue. And then if you see his eyes, I, I, people ask me, why did you keep his eyes closed? Because what I believe is um, when, when, you, when you pray, when you reach for inner strength, when you reach for something that is within yourself and you want to reach God, you keep your eyes closed, you're in meditation, you're in prayer. And I feel that prayer is the highest form of communion with God and with oneself. So that's why I actually made Jesus's, uh, I made Jesus' eyes um, uh, open and then, then I closed it um, for that very reason. And then the hands. I have Jesus holding a lamb in his hands because what I'm saying is uh, Jesus protects us no matter who we are no matter what we are Jesus will always protect us and we need to remember that that is the most beautiful thing about Christianity is that there is someone to always be there for us and then um, and to give you an example last year when uh, when I was in uh, the Vatican and this is a work by Raphael where uh, we have Plato on one side and Aristotle on the other side how do we know that Raphael is creating Plato and Aristotle because Plato says that uh, by the way this this uh, mural is called School of Athens where he's shown all the philosophers and uh, Galileo the mathematicians astronomers everybody is there the artists all of them are there he's shown all of them I showed this one particular because uh, Plato says that the, the material world does not matter. It's all about ideas and concepts and, and, and the body will die, but we can the spirit will remain and move to another form. Therefore, it is the energy that matters, the living, the, the physical does not matter, says Plato. Hence, his hands are up facing the heavens. Aristotle, his, uh, what does Aristotle say? He says, we, it is all about the here and now. Today is what matters. It does not matter. Theories don't matter. Um, our ideas don't matter. It is what we do today and now that matters. So Raphael is showing uh, these two artists with their hands also the colors. Uh, Aristotle is in earthy colors and, and Plato is in red for fire and ether. Uh, so, so again, he's also using color to explain his, uh, his characters. 
Um, the third part of it is uh, allegory, where I'm tell telling the story about the birth of Christ, because what I'm saying is uh, here, here, are, uh, here is Mother Mary, Father Joseph, uh, baby Jesus uh, in the manger, and, uh, and, and they're in the center of the installation, and then the, the, there are stories on either side as well that kind of um, um, complete the story. So that is uh, Jesus, and then Mother Mary. Created Mother Mary in bread. Why? Because when you, uh, I think every, uh, my friend Deepa and I were having this conversation just a few days back about how uh, we all connect with Mother Mary because for us, uh, she's the epitome of motherhood and we all try to aspire to be like her, to be, to be uh, giving and to be, uh, to sacrifice and to hold and to find strength through every uh, hurdle that our child will go through because that is the hardest thing for a mother is to see um, suffering for your child and and so if mother mary can do it we can do it so but it shows passion it shows emotion it shows pain it shows suffering and for me those feelings are red so it's not blue for me blue is life red is feeling so so that's why i showed mother mary in red and then her face her eyes are downcast and she's in a veil because uh, that's the, she's showing submission she's showing resignation she's showing um, a sense of compliance uh, and it, it's it's very hard to create emotion in class because it's a very rigid material but i tried so hard to create this 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 depth of feeling that a person should should feel when you see Mother Mary. So, um, and then then I showed the two sides. It's a it's a it's a technique called trichromy, where you put three layers of glass against each other to create depth, three dimensionality uh, to the work. And then you don't see it so much over here because pictures can only do so much. But in real, you will see that her hands are clenched because uh, you know we always say that if you really want to understand a person, look at their eyes and look at their hands because her hands look like she's in pain, but she's she's standing straight and she's she's looking down, but she's in pain and her hands are showing that. Then the allegorical part. I'm showing um, mother below Mother Mary. I'm showing Bethlehem. Why? Because Bethlehem uh, is the city for me. It's a sense of home, and Mother Mary being a mother, it, it connects with the idea of home. So that's why below her, I've shown the animals around the manger, but below her is. Uh, the silent spectator, which is the city of Bethlehem, looking on in uh, at the manger, at the birth of Christ, and celebrating this this special moment. And 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 with Mother Mary, you also see the angels descending down from the heavens and also partaking. So it's the real, the ethereal, the metaphysical. All the worlds come together. The an animate, the inanimate. All the worlds come together to celebrate this joyous moment. Father Joseph. I've created Father Joseph in yellow. I was actually asked by Father Sunoj in the past, why did I choose to, to show Father Joseph in yellow? Because Father Joseph, he is supposed to lead, he's supposed to lead the camel and uh, Mother Mary, a pregnant maid, and he has to carry, he has to take them through the desert. So for me, the clothes are symbolic of uh, the sand dunes and the color, uh, the, the, the browns and the yellows are symbolic of the desert. And around him is the yellow, which is symbolic of the, of the glaring sun that is beating down on him as he holds his staff in his hand he's a shepherd and he's 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 taking them on this journey and and below him allegorically is, uh, is the the three kings who are also crossing the desert and wild terrain mountains and oceans to come to celebrate the birth of the king so uh, that 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 relation i thought is very very important um, father joseph represents journey mother mary represents home and um, the, jesus represents 
the unity and totality of the universe. And his face, his face is stoic because when I look at my father or I look at generally men, um, uh, even my husband, there's always, uh, you know, whatever they're going through, they never show it. There's always this strength in them that you kind of hold on to, but they go through so much inside, but they don't show it. And there's always this, this absolute uh, stillness on their face so that's why I showed Father Joseph also the same way like very calm and stoic I'm sure he has a lot there's such a great responsibility that God has entrusted him with but he remains calm in the face of great peril and he he takes uh, he, he fulfills the, the journey that he is commissioned to do now, the hardest part of this entire installation is actually right here when I was doing the Three Kings and, you know, glass as a material, it's so different from painting because in painting you, you, you draw with the, with the brush and, and you're done. What happens with glass is you create and then you put it in the kiln and then the glass will expand. So you have to uh, not only be an artist, but you also have to be a scientist, you have to be a physicist, a chemist, you have to remember, uh, calculate exactly how much that expansion has to be so that it is, uh, it is uh, in sync, it is in scale with the rest of the entire installation. So this was one of the hardest parts of of the of the um, of the uh, installation where the 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 rains had to be as uh, thin as my hair one strand of one 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 hair so that when it expands it's just right the other thing is the face when it's in profile when glass moves at 1500 degrees glass will expand glass becomes a liquid and then the nose can become where the eyes are I mean glass is going to move how do you how do you control that so it is just these are right here these are the miracles that happened with my installation which I just kind of baffle at because I wish that miracle would come back and help me with the things that actually make me sell because life would be so simple but after this work none of my work has been so so linear it's been so difficult I had to make it over and over again but God knows and I know that this was a miracle right here because everything was perfect the work transcended the art. I created this work. It is seven feet, nine inches in height and 34 inches wide. And there was no place for me to create it in my house. So I was creating panel by panel, piece by piece, working on the minutia, working on little details. And then I would take it to my construction site where we were remodeling the house and I would assemble it over there, piece by piece, over weeks and months. The work kept happening. And, uh, and then uh, once uh, uh, the, uh, Jesus Christ panel was done and I went to take a break because I was just so tired and I came back and I saw the most unbelievable thing. Until that point, all I was doing was creating whatever was coming into my head from wherever it was coming, I was creating it. It was a very direct process of listening and doing, except this happened. One of, I, I had the panel uh, assembled and when I came back, one of the construction crew was bent over the Christ panel and praying. For me, that was the most unbelievable moment of my life because that's when I realized what I had created. The work transcended the art. What I had done as a mere artist is the work is far, far beyond that because I had created a work that people now uh, it became sacred, which I never even expected. Why the triptych? Um, people have asked me this question. Why did I make it a triptych? Um, the reason for that is if you remember when I was in Catholic school, like I said, I was six years old and then the panel that was there in my Catholic school was a triptych. So that is 
one reason I think that manifested itself in my in my brain somewhere and 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 that caused me to you know make it larger than life huge installation and and the only means that I could make it work is through a triptych but here is another example I'm not the first one to do it here is another example by Tadio Gadi in the 13th century at the Basilica of Santa Croce in Florence Italy he created this triptych uh, which has on the four miracles each panel of the two miracles and then the middle panel is the tree of life and in the bottom is the last supper. So this is a direct relation from a 13th century artist who I never even knew about to the triptych that I created in present day time. Another example of the triptych is uh, when I was studying in Boston, uh, Trinity Chapel, uh, with the three archways. So this is where you use a triptych in architectural sense as well. So the three-partied archway for the entrances, and then when you come in, um, the, the, the triptych in the, on the altar as well. Um, this is a church that I crossed every day uh, to my to when I would go to the graduate school at Harvard. This is within Harvard Yard, um, right across from the Widener Library. And then, if you see, this also kind of is like the triptych, the three base system. So, if you see that, that it's got the three the three uh, triptych, the three tripartite system, and then here is the the three part system of the church as well which I think in some way manifested. And then the Boston Public Library, which has the, the three-part uh, entryway. And then this was designed by Mick and Mead and White in 1889 in Boston, Massachusetts, a place that I frequented a lot, one of my most favorite places in Boston. And in, in present day time, when Philip Johnson created the addition to the Boston Public Library, uh, he did not use any of the motifs of this Renaissance building, but what he did use was the triptych. From here, it became these three. So, um, in a sense, the idea of the triptych uh, is something that connects to a lot of artists and architects. And for me, the most beautiful form of the triptych was right here. When you go into the Boston Public Library and you are in this closed space, except the three windows from above, the clear story windows uh, that bring in light, uh, it's so powerful. It's almost like it's welcoming you into the library, as if to say, come and learn and achieve a higher uh, level of living. So this, this is so poetic for me. So I, I kind of use that concept also that, that was so embedded in my mind that it manifested itself in the triptych that I created. I went to the Vatican, I presented at the Venice Biennale, like uh, Kevin said, uh, uh, last March. And after that, I went to the Vatican. And, and, uh, and then three months after that, I came to St. Michael's. And I could see some very startling uh, similarities between the two that I just wanted to highlight because I just love this church. I think this uh, this this church is uh, such a such a beautiful space, and it reminds me of of Rome. It reminds me of the Vatican, and so I thought I'll share that with you as well. So in the Vatican, um, the uh, the piazza. Uh, of Borromini, the oval-shaped piazza, uh, reminds me of the piazza you have outside St. Michael's. It's this kind of same uh, idea. And then uh, with the eight uh, 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 pathways, which you also have over here, the eight pathways. In the center of uh, the uh, the piazza uh, of uh, um, St. Peter's Basilica, uh, we have the ancient obelisk, which was the witness of the uh, crucifixion of St. Peter under Emperor Nero. And uh, the interesting thing is that uh, over here also, uh, we have the sculpture of St. Michael in the center of your oval piazza right here. And then the colonnade, the colonnade of Bernini that, that we had, that, that is there at the Vatican, you have a colonnade right here uh, outside your piazza too, that I love walking around. It's such a beautiful space, reminds me of Rome. 
Um, and then you have the narthex over here, and I'm going to talk about the narthex at the Vatican. Um, over here at the at the, at the Vatican, the uh, the narthex kind of reminds me of the triptych because the center has the portico with the uh, entryways, and then on this side is the statue of Charlemagne, and then on, on this side is the vision of Constantine created by Bernini. So this, in a sense, also forms a triptych. Now the narthex over here does not have artwork yet, but um, I think that this is so powerful that you know you have. You have the, uh, the, the narthex flanked on either end by these uh, equestrian sculptures that you don't find anywhere else in the Vatican. And even when you walk into the, the St. Peter's Basilica uh, from the outside, uh, the styles will change, um, but uh, the, the sculptures are there. And, and that is a beautiful thing. I was very pleasantly surprised when I saw Henry Matisse's glass panel, not glass panels, the cutouts of the glass panels in the antechamber or narthex of the Sistine Chapel. So while we were waiting here, an extremely modern triptych of Henry Matisse is what we see before you enter this Renaissance Sistine Chapel of the 15th and 16th century. So here is a uh, 20th century artist and here is a 15th century uh, conglomerate of artists. So that, that kind of juxtaposition is so interesting to me as an artist. So uh, I have a very special relationship with the narthex. Um, in churches. It, I, I, every time I go to a church, people go into the church, I go into the narthex. Because I feel that um, the narthex for me, in a sense, is that place where we, uh, it, it, it's, it's a metaphor for a human, for a person's journey. Many times in your life, you come to the crossroads of your life when you make a decision, which way do you want to go? Do you want to go this way or that way? And, and for me, um, the narthex is symbolic of that. Narthex, the threshold of heaven and earth. I know Kevin and I have had conversations ad nauseum about this, about the, how do you, how, how does, how, how are, how is the narthex articulated? connecting the outside and inner realm. It, it could be in your mind, it could be physically as a human being, it could be in your life, it could be in a church. So for me, studying in, when I was studying at Harvard, uh, MIT was very close, it was just a few streets down, and I would always come to the Kresge Chapel, designed by Eros Arnen in, uh, in 1929. But um, when I would walk to this chapel, um, and I would walk, uh, here, this is this is the narthex. This is the antechamber before you come into the chapel. Look how beautiful that narthex is. That the glass and just the, the stained glass and you know, it's for me. It's almost it's like that personal connection with God. And this is the collective connection with God. This is where you're with the church. You're with other people, and you're together praying. But this is when you're praying by yourself, when you have that exam, you want to pass, or you're having a difficult time, or you're missing your family. And I've sat here, I've cried here, I have rejoiced here, I have talked to myself here, argued with myself. I can do all that over here in the narthex, which I cannot do in the church. But this space is so, so powerful for me as an artist. And that was when I was an architecture student. But it just recently, I think a couple of years back, uh, I went to Sagrada Familia in, in Spain, in Barcelona, Spain. I had to present over there and after that, um, my family and I went to Sagrada Familia. And here also, if you see the work of, this is, this is the creation of Anthony Gaudi. And Gaudi has created three narthex. There's one over here. There's one over here, and there's one over here. I'm going to, this is the last part of my, my talk today. I, I'm, I'll just have a few more slides, but I just want to say that in my entire life, I have never ever felt more connected to another human being as I do with Anthony Gaudi. 
the, arch the artist slash architect who died in 1926, 46 years before I was born. But we are connected through, through time, through, through design, and I will show you why. Um, he's, this is Sagrada Familia, it's a Roman Catholic church. Um, it just got consecra consecrated in 2010, and uh, it has three, three portals, one, two, and three. Now, the, uh, the portal on the east is called the Nativity Portal with its narthex. The portal on the west is called the Passion of Christ, and the, por the portal on the south is called the Glory Portal. So here, this is I'm I'm illustrating the um, the Passion of Christ portal. This is the narthex, and like I created my triptych with three vertical panels. Um, Gaudi created his triptych with three horizontal panels, and they tell the story of of the crucifixion of Christ a lot of pain, a lot of uh, mourning, and finally the uh, crucifixion of Christ. But if you see his work, if you see Gaudi's work, if you see the sculptures, it's not, it's not real, there's no realism. It is through symbology and through um, just the form, the, the, the allegory that he's telling the story. It's, he doesn't, he, it's, his, his sculptures are absolutely bare. And it, it, you can't even tell sometimes other than the robe, you can't even tell if it's a man or a woman. But the, what is important is the story and the symbolism that it carries in the narthex. But when you cross the threshold and you come into the church, an explosion of color. He uses color unabashedly, but there's no, uh, uh, there is no um, uh, figures in, in the colors. The figures, it's completely devoid of colors, uh, devoid of figures. The figures are all outside, but absolutely monochromatic. So see how the style changes from the outside being very stark and monochromatic. You come into the church where it is full of color and no figures. So um, in that regard, I feel that we are connected because uh, like my figures are iconological. They are, they are, not, they are not meant to be real. Like I, I remember as a child, I've had conversations where, well, what do you think Jesus looked like? Did he have blonde hair or did he have black hair? Or, you know, what, what, where do you think he's from? And how? it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to me today. I, and, and that is what I'm trying to tell the world, that it doesn't matter what Jesus looked like, where he came from, what was his genealogy. It doesn't matter. It is about what he is, what does he represent to us. Jesus is love, Jesus is giving, Jesus is everything that we should strive to be every single day of our lives and if we can achieve that then we have achieved greatness or at least we have tried to achieve greatness. It doesn't matter about the minutiae and that is, that, that is why I have made my sculptures look absolutely iconological because I'm trying to tell the story, I'm not trying to tell uh, a fact. And then uh, also another thing that Gaudi and I really connect on is the use of color. This is, I've not seen this unless I'm mistaken, I don't know, but from whatever I have read and seen, I have not seen this ever done by another artist before. Using color to explain a message, to give a message. For example, when he uses blue, he uses the nativity portal. The nativity portal is showing blue. Why? Because blue for him represents life, like I did. So he represented nativity with blue, like I did. And then on the other hand over there, which is the passion of Christ, which talks about, um, it talks about pain and suffering and, and crucifixion. There he uses yellows, and oranges and reds. I use yellows and oranges and reds to show Mother Mary and Father Joseph who have to go through all this to see this, to see uh, Jesus Christ go through the, the, what he is put on earth to, to do. So for me, these colors represent emotions, stark emotions, pain, sorrow, which is exactly what Gaudi did. Um, 
and and if you see the colors when i walked into that that uh, basilica i saw the colors and it was like i had vis i was sitting across from gaudi and i was creating and he was creating and we were both using the same palette of colors it's unnatural how we both had exactly the same colors the color palette that we were working with when i was doing this uh, i did not even know about sagrada familia except for a 2 inch by 3 inch sketch in my architectural history book where he talks about casa mila that was like a half page chapter that we had to study i never even knew about sagrada familia when i was creating my work but but it's like after i saw this after the work was created and i saw uh, sagrada familia it's like i could not have felt more connected to this uh, this this great architect who they say was on his way to sainthood so this is my this is my nativity triptych uh, i have taken you through india and saudi arabia and england and the united states and europe and but i just wanted to tell you that um, there is no greater religion Uh, history has shown the world has witnessed that of all the different um, entities in this earth christianity and catholicism is that one body uh, that really celebrates nurtures nourishes artists i'm going to take the the words of the father of architecture louis kahn who said art and architecture is the medium through which men and women have expressed the thoughts of their generation through time and nowhere can we see that evolution or the, the change through time more than the christian faith than the catholic faith so with my heart and my soul i thank this religion i thank the people who practice this religion i am not of this faith but i have tremendous gratitude and respect for this religion for supporting artists for celebrating artists for for nurturing us and for nourishing us and for letting us be who we are thank you